It is simply a fact that the tomb of Muhammad is in Medina. Uh, the bones of the Buddha are in India, but in Jerusalem is the empty tomb. Testament lesson is taken from Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 20. 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Here ends the second lesson. Heavenly Father, we do pray now that your Holy Spirit will take your written word and teach us tonight about your living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that for his name's sake. Amen. The uh, city of Corinth was uh, a multi-faith city uh, with a vengeance, or so it would seem, from uh, Paul's letter to uh, the Christians uh, at uh, uh, the church in, Cor in Colossae. On uh, these Sunday evenings, we're studying this letter as it's highly relevant for us today. For Western Europe, it's getting progressively more multi-faith as the uh, days uh, and years go by. So will you then turn to Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 15 to 20. You've got that on page 
1182 of the Bibles uh, in the pews, and if necessary, do share with your neighbor. And uh, on the back page of your service sheet, you've got some space to take uh, some notes if you'd like to do that. Our subject this evening is Christ above all. Colossians 1 verse 18 uh, talks of Christ having in everything the supremacy. So my headings, if you want to jot them down, are, after some words of introduction, first, Christ the supreme revealer of God. Uh, Secondly, Christ supreme in his person. Thirdly, Christ the supreme creator. Fourthly, Christ the supreme reconciler. And fifthly, Christ supreme in the church. Christ the supreme revealer of God. Uh, Christ supreme in his person. Christ the supreme creator. Christ the supreme reconciler. And Christ supreme in the church. The situation at Colossae was this. Uh, The church in the city needs some clear guidance. Uh, It is being attacked not by physical persecution, but by false teaching and strange ideas. So Paul prays for these folk accordingly, even though uh, he does not know them personally, as we learnt last week. Yes, things were very like today. Uh, There was a lot of what we call New Age religion. It seems this was a mixture of Jewish and Greek Gnostic ideas. Gnosis means knowledge. uh, And much of this knowledge was very wacky indeed. It's hard for established Christians uh, in our own world, the Western world, uh, and uh, in Europe with a bombardment of uh, multi-faithism from the media in our schools. It's hard for Christians to hold their own. What must have been like for these very new Christians in Colossae Uh, with little teaching and uh, little support. Not easy. So how they needed Paul's prayers. But after praying, what does Paul do? Answer, he majors on the greatness of Jesus Christ. For this underlines the New Testament teaching needed by the Colossians and for today and summed up by Peter Uh, in uh, the words recorded in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved Christ uniquely is above all so first Paul deals with the issue of revelation and he says that Christ is the supreme revealer of God. Look at the first part of verse 15. It says, He, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. That's to say, Christ is the exact likeness of God, like an image on a coin or or, uh, the reflection in a mirror. Christ reveals the true nature and being of God. The Bible is so clear about this. John 1, verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side. That's Jesus Christ, the word incarnate, has made him known. Paul is saying the same thing. Jesus Christ, the divine Son, alone is the revealer of God. But it's probable that the people in Colossae had not grasped this. Uh, Nor, sadly, have many in the churches today. Being seduced by current multifaithism, they easily believe that all religions and philosophies will get you to God in the end. It's just that some are better than others. The Bible makes it clear that that is wrong. For Christ alone reveals God. But uh, to understand the nature of these strange Colossian ideas, you need to understand that God reveals himself in two ways generally as well as specially. Let me explain. The Colossians and we today need to know that Christianity means accepting God's special revelation of himself in Jewish history and supremely in Jesus Christ. And we discover that special revelation through Christ's apostles and what they have taught about him. And today that is recorded for us 
in the Holy Spirit-inspired apostolic book, the Bible, you there discover God's special revelation. And you discover how God restores men and women to fellowship with himself. Men and women who, by nature, have rejected that fellowship. For you read how God the Father, by God the Holy Spirit, leads you to faith in God the Son, Jesus Christ, as the world's saviour. That is what you learn through God's special revelation in the Bible. But there is not only God's special revelation about Christ that you have in the Bible. There's also God's general revelation that comes to all men and women through the natural created world. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. And Paul writes about that in Romans chapter 1 uh, and chapter 2. For example, he says in chapter 1 verses 19 and 20 that what may be known about God is plain to them, that's non-believers, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So not only can people see some basic realities about God, they do see them. They are clearly seen. But this brings an obligation to worship and thank God, so Paul says uh, in Romans 1 verse 21. And in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, he teaches that people also know God's moral law. And they also know that sin deserves punishment. Romans 1, verse 32, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that God's general revelation is okay for the Garden of Eden, uh, for men and women who are completely good and trusting God. General revelation answers the question, what does God want rational, sane human beings to do? However, general revelation also speaks of punishment for wrongdoing. But it does not speak of God's forgiveness uh, and mercy and strength to obey when there is wrongdoing. Not unnaturally, fallen, wrongdoing people and only knowing general revelation react negatively to uh, a fear of God's judgment. So they either try to ignore God's truth, which deep down they know, uh, or they try to change that truth by forms of idolatry uh, of ancient or modern varieties, of course, and by lawlessness, calling right wrong and uh, wrong right. Now that is what Paul teaches in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2. Undoubtedly, all this was going on in Colossae, and it has gone on throughout history. Hence, the varieties of beliefs that uh, people hold, ignoring the true God. Of course, not all that is taught in other belief systems, other religions, and other philosophies is false uh, today, or it was false in Colossae. For as there is God's general revelation, as well as his special revelation, so there's God's common grace, as well as his saving grace for believers. His common grace, like his general revelation, comes to all human beings, including those who reject Christ. Our Father God causes, Jesus says, his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And that common grace prevents God's truth from being totally suppressed. Paul, for example, quotes approvingly a pagan poet in his sermon uh, or speech at Athens. You read about that in Acts 17. Why then do you need to share your faith with friends of other faiths? As the Colossians were doing. We saw that uh, uh, in the first verses of, verses of chapter 1. It's for this reason. Other faiths, then and now, either deny or ignore the trinity of one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So whatever else they might say, they can say nothing about the number one issue, which is the good news of salvation. For this alone comes from the grace of God the Father and the cross and resurrection of God the Son, Jesus Christ, and new life 
uh, new birth by God the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, when you talk to friends of other faiths and philosophies and uh, none about Jesus Christ, do speak, and we must speak, with humility. Uh, that is so important for everything you and I know about the special revelation of God uh, in uh, Christ's gospel has been received as a gift from God. His Holy Spirit has given you faith and opened your spiritual eyes. So remember that evangelism and uh, sharing faith is always like one beggar uh, showing another beggar where to find bread. So Christ is the supreme revealer of God. Secondly, Christ is supreme in his person. Look at verse 15, the second part. He is the firstborn over all creation. Uh, here, firstborn is not meaning Christ is the first in a series. Uh, he's not the first of all created things, because as we're told in verses 16 and 17, he is the one by whom the whole creation came into being. Verse 16, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. The word firstborn can refer either uh, to priority in time or in uh, rank. Perhaps both meanings are to be understood. Christ is before all creation and supreme over it. He is its Lord. So Paul is saying that Jesus is not just one of the great spiritual leaders of this world. He's not Jesus the Great, like Alexander the Great or Charles the Great. He's not the Great, he's the only. He has no equals or successors. Look at verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. The New Testament is clear that Jesus Christ was, while being truly man, truly God. That is why he has no equals or successors. But what's the evidence that these claims are true? Well, look at verse 18. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. It is simply a fact that the tomb of Muhammad is in Medina. Uh, the bones of the Buddha are in India, but in Jerusalem is the empty tomb. That is the evidence, the real resurrection of Jesus Christ to a new order of existence, leaving a tomb empty. So Christ is supreme in his person. Thirdly, Christ is the supreme creator. Look at verse 16 again, and then verse 17. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That is uh, absolutely staggering and mind-blowing. And Paul was not some weird Gnostic teacher, but a serious thinking scholar. In verse, literally, it's, uh, in verse 16, literally, it's not um, by him, but in him all things were created. In is as when you say uh, that final authority is in the crown or uh, in the uh, managing director uh, or whoever. So creation, we are told, was within the authority or sphere or power of Christ. Verse 17 then says, all things were created by him and for him. That is saying that Christ is the agent through whom this whole universe, all things, actually came into being. It came from God the Father through Christ the Son. And this whole universe is for him. He is the end for which all things exist. He is the goal to which we are all moving, either to be with him forever, or if we reject him, not to be with him. And that means, says Jesus, dire consequences. Verse uh, 17 uh, says, the last part, in him all things hold together. Presumably outside Christ, 
the opposite is the case. Former Bishop of Durham, Bishop Lightfoot, spoke of Christ being the principle of cohesion who makes the universe a cosmos uh, instead of a chaos. But do you see what Paul is saying for the individual? He is saying that Jesus Christ, whether you realize it or not, keeps your heart going and your lungs working. Uh, he keeps your income coming in, your house firm on its foundations, and gravity working. Uh, in fact, he is holding and sustaining this whole universe. And that includes you and me. Christ was not only active in your conception when your parents conceive you, he also now keeps you uh, and your life uh, going with life and breath and food and shelter day by day. Do you thank him for that? Millions upon millions do not. But as we've seen, according to Paul, uh, in uh, Romans 1 and general revelation even, not to thank God is sin. And any sin separates you from God. And we all sin. And so you and I need to be reconciled to God. And that's why, fourthly, it's good news that Christ is the supreme reconciler and not just the supreme creator. Look at verses 18 and then 19 and 20. And uh, he is the head of the body, the church, for God was pleased through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is atonement for the whole universe. The whole universe is somehow in need of reconciliation, but it is being reconciled. The process began that first Good Friday. The primal first sin of Adam, the first man, has affected us all such that we all have an anti-God instinct. But somehow it's also affected the entire universe of nature. However, the cross, says Paul, has cosmic effects and will free even nature. He makes that clearer in Romans chapter 8, verse 21 says, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And that glorious freedom can begin now for individual men and women. Christ rescues them now from the dominion of darkness and brings them into the kingdom of the Son God loves. We heard that last week, verse 14 of Colossians 1. I wonder if there's anyone here tonight who needs to make that transition from one dominion to another kingdom. Well, if so, thank God for your creation and preservation, but above all, for the salvation offered you through Jesus Christ and trust him. And if you are asking questions, on the bookstall there's the little book, Why Jesus, which uh, uh, folk f find helpful by Nicky Gumbel. They're free for you to take. Your problem, my problem, uh, everyone's problem is sin. Men and women need to be reconciled to God for ignoring and rejecting him. But they need a saviour to reconcile them and to fulfil God's reconciling plan of salvation. And there is only one saviour, Jesus Christ. No other religion provides such a saviour who dies for sin in our place, bearing our guilt and our sin. Buddhism, for example, sees the human problem in suffering rather than in sin. Salvation is through striving to abolish desire. Hinduism sees salvation through reincarnation uh, and uh, in that way paying for wrong previously committed. Judaism has sinners seeking God's mercy, but uh, it does not have God making the first move towards sinners. Islam, too, proclaims the mercy of God. But again, Allah is only merciful to those who deserve mercy, not the undeserving. And so you can go on. Christ alone is the supreme reconciler of humankind to God. Fifthly, Christ is supreme in the church. In a multi-faith world, the Colossians, and we today need the body of Christ, the church, for mutual support, encouragement, learning, and strength from one another. 
But to be effective, the church needs to be led and guided by its head, Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says he is the head of the body, the church. And to be faithful in Christ, uh, to Christ in Colossae, uh, and today one thing was and is particularly necessary, not to separate the sacred and the secular. For there was then and there is now uh, in many quarters a separation between the two, the sacred and the secular. Uh, and that's to be avoided. As we shall see, some of these false teachers in Colossae were saying that uh, the material or normal world of experience every day was either unimportant or bad. The spiritual was all that mattered. So they would have liked the idea of Christ as a reconciler, but not as a creator involved in everyday life uh, in this material world. But Christ's reconciling and creative work must not be divided. Christ is, uh, and he is to be in our personal experience, Lord of all. Uh, how vital, therefore, that uh, we live him from Monday to Saturday uh, in our everyday secular lives and not just on Sundays when we're being spiritual and sacred. And don't forget Christ's creative work as you study the Bible. Read the Bible, including the Old Testament, that uh, Christ says testifies to him, John 5 verse 39, to learn, yes, about God's salvation and reconciling plan that Christ fulfills. But uh, learn also about Christ's creative work in the formation and collapse of societies and in the development and decline of individuals. Don't neglect all the wisdom books uh, and the Psalms and the Song of Solomon. Christ is the supreme head of his body, the church. In a multi-faith world, of course, you need to focus on the reconciling work of Christ and the good news of God's salvation plan as it affects individuals. <laughs> but don't ignore Christ's creative work. People in Colossae may have been tempted to do just that. That is not to honour the head of the church and his work, which is both creative and reconciling. I must conclude. I do so with some words of the late uh, Leslie Newbigin, uh, a Northeast man and a world Christian leader, uh, about living as a Christian in a multi-faith world. He writes, if in fact it is true that almighty God, creator and sustainer of all that exists in heaven and on earth, has, at a time known, at a known time and place in human history, so humbled himself as to become part of our sinful humanity and to suffer and die a shameful death, to take away our sin and to rise from the dead as the first fruits of a new creation, if this is a fact, then to affirm it is not arrogance. To remain quiet about it is treason to our fellow human beings. Colossians 1 verses 15 to 20, the verses we've been looking at tonight, encourage us both to stand firm uh, against wrong and false ideas, but also to share our faith with those of other faiths and none, and not to be quiet. Let's pray. Let's just have a moment of silence and uh, let's respond to this passage. As the Holy Spirit would guide us, we're all from and in different situations. Let's pray as is appropriate. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers.